Welcome to this extra um, slide set on um, insertion of tunnel central venous catheter, part of the Global Kidney Academy Hospital uh, online course. Um, my name is Nick Farden. I'm an interventional nephrologist uh, from Sheffield in the UK. Uh, these slides are, are not uh, mandatory to your course. I just thought it would be helpful for people to um, for me to talk through the insertion of a tunneled catheter because the other lecture uh, are about temporary catheters um, but some of the techniques here are similar um, and for those of you who already master temporary catheters this is something that I think you should be working towards. So let me uh, talk you through the, the slides. These are uh, a series of, of still shots rather than a video um, so as we as we join now, I've already um, pre-scanned the patient's neck with ultrasound machine, um, wiped away the jelly, I've cleaned once with 2% chlorhexidine, I've gone and uh, scrubbed, uh, so I've now got a gown and, and gloves on, and I've now um, uh, got a pot of chlorhexidine on my trolley and I'm cleaning using some sponge holders uh, and a sponge chair, cleaning the patient's skin for a second time. Obviously the patient is wide awake. This is done at a local anaesthetic. Uh, you can tell this is a few years ago, well I can, because we were still using nice cotton sheets. Nowadays it's all uh, disposable uh, sheets, I'm afraid. Uh, so this is a simple way of just toweling people up, uh, which I won't go into in detail. Uh, that's the second towel, and that's the third towel. This is a three towel to give me uh, access to the, um, to the neck area that I require. Uh, next, I've been handed a um, ultrasound, and I've covered that with a sterile um, cover so that uh, all the ultrasound equipment is is sterile. And I've clamped it to the towel. On my trolley, uh, I've opened up the uh, catheter pack itself, uh, and this is a um, what's called a palindrome catheter, um, uh, made by a company called Covidian. Um, I don't use many of them, but I was using them at this time, uh, and uh, they, they, they are, it's a good catheter uh, with a completely symmetrical uh, end to it. So although they're marked uh, as red and, and blue, although the red is more brown, um, the ends are completely symmetrical, and that has some advantages. So what I've done in preparation is uh, I flush uh, the uh, each lumen uh, and then clamp it off, and then I'll do the same for the blue lumen. I also usually moisten the cuff here uh, with some saline. Uh, I've jumped a stage, but uh, I've scanned the patient's neck with ultrasound, worked out where I want to go, uh, and then I've begun to anaesthetize the skin. And I've done this as a strip of, of low anaesthetic. You'll see why uh, in a moment. It's worth showing the anatomy. Uh, these are the two heads of sternocleidomastoid, this is the sternal head, this is the clavicular head. Uh, and for reasons that I'll explain later, I'm actually going to puncture this vein from uh, lateral and low down, so lateral to the uh, clavicular head of sternocleidomastoid. Um, usually you would have started up here uh, in, the, in this triangle for a temporary catheter and punctured down this way. I'll explain why it's slightly different for a tunnel catheter. This is uh, how it appears on the ultrasound uh, with the carotid artery at the bottom, the right internal jugular, and this is the muscle uh, sitting above uh, and the fat layers. Uh, and this is the route that the needle will come in in a moment. So here we are, I've got the ultrasound in my left hand. Notice how I stabilise the ultrasound on the um, patient's neck uh, and makes it easier for me and it also stops me pressing down too hard uh, all the ultrasound s slipping and sliding keeps everything nice and steady um, I've got the needle just inserting I'm following the tip and as I advance the needle this probe will tip with the wire here coming towards me uh, so that I begin to look more in this direction over to the uh, further down the vein this is what you see on the ultrasound, so you don't see the needle because it's cross-sectional view, but this is me just injecting some local anaesthetic uh, at this point here onto the vein. 
I've now swapped uh, to the introduction and needle on a 20mm syringe uh, and uh, I've again used ultrasound to punch exactly the same route uh, down into the vein. And this just shows uh, the way I've come in. It's just, it's just slightly funny to come in the side of the vein like this, but the reason for that is that uh, that's my needle coming into the vein, as it were. And the reason is that when you tunnel the catheter in a few minutes, that makes a nice smooth curve here, uh, bringing the catheter round and then into the vein and down towards the right atrium. So, um, I've now passed a wire through that needle. And uh, again, a stage you haven't seen, I've put some clamps there. These are mosquito uh, forceps uh, uh, across the chest wall. And I've used fluoroscopy to show that this is the middle of the right atrium. Uh, and now I'm measuring back here with the catheter. I'm hovering, I'm not touching it on the skin, I'm just hovering it over the skin just to measure back to work out where my exit site is going to be. Uh, just here. And now I'm anaesthetizing the exit site using an orange needle and then I always run the first bit of the tunnel completely vertical. I don't head towards in this direction, I head up and then round. And I've put a scalpel in and now I'm just slightly just opening up the exit site uh, and opening up a little bit more just the first bit of the tunnel. I've equally incised the neck and just opening up the tissues here slightly. Uh, in these packs, the tunneling rod is completely straight. In other um, packs, you see the rod with a slight bend on the end. Uh, both are wrong. Uh, the way I'm going to show you for bending a tunneling rod, uh, I can tell you after thousands of these lines, it is the best way. So the first thing I do is put a really nice, big, smooth, like a quarter of a circle here, uh, a smooth curve on this uh, tip of the, of the tunneling rod. The next thing I do is to push the tunneling rod back into the catheter. And because this is a, it's got a symmetrical tip with both lumens coming right to the end, it's got this, uh, these two prongs on this particular tunneling rod. I'm next going to move this cover down to cover all this up. There it is. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've put a, a second bend. So this was the first bend. Uh, I couldn't make the second bend till I've attached the catheter here and slid this uh, cover down. And then I make a second bend. And this bend allows me to, to rotate um, the rod as I need it, the tunneling rod. I've then pushed it vertically up here, you don't see that, and then I've gone round the corner and come out. I'm now bending it so it's one big smooth curve. I've just taken both ends of the tunneling rod and bent it between my two hands. And the next thing is I'm pulling it through. So just dragging the, in a slow steady way, uh, the tunneling rod through. It looks painful, patients normally find this bit okay. So what we've got now, we've got the, the line partially tunnelled, the cuff is, is too big to fit into this exit site, which is as we want, then running vertical and then coming round. The way we get the cuff underneath is to pop some mosquitoes under the cuff, slide them round to the top edge, points upwards, and then as I begin to pull here on the, on the line, I just simply take my mosquitoes out. Here I go, just open them up and take them out and then just a pull. That just moves the skin edge away and uh, allows me to pull this into the, into the tunnel. Next we begin to dilate. So this is the uh, dilator. This is a 12 French uh, dilator. As I take it out, I obviously need to press with my middle finger, my left hand, using my um, index finger and thumb to control the wire of my left hand. I'm now putting in the final dilator. This is a, uh, this bit is dilator and this bit is a tearaway sheath. The lighter gray is the dilator, the darker gray is the tearaway sheath. Um, again, holding the wire with my left hand, I insert this uh, with the right hand, slight twisting is needed. 
So here we've got uh, the tear away sheath fully inserted with the dilator and wire still inside. And the next stage is to remove the dilator and the wire. Uh, so they're now out and this is a valved sheath so there's a little valve here and I'm about to push again handling the catheter using a swab about to push it into the valve which I've now done and I've now slid the valve out of the way on this particular type of tearaway sheath and next you crack the tearaway sheath in half be a little bit careful as you do that you don't take pull the line out so you just see my finger just gently keeping an eye on that, pressing that as I tear the sheath away. And you're left with just a little pinch here, uh, and in this case I use the mosquito forceps just to help with that in. So there we are, the, the catheter is now exit site here, running up here, round smooth curve and into the vein. We next take an x-ray to check on that, you see the same thing here, vertical smooth curve, enter the skin, enter the vein, down, a bit of a wiggly, right anonymous vein, and the tip sitting in the middle of the right atrium, uh, just about here. Next, importantly, check it works. So I've checked each of the lumens. You can see the bit of blood here that I've pulled out of the blue, and now I'm just checking the red one. And now, and having checked it, I then flush each of them with saline. Uh, and then I would normally use a lock solution and a, a cap on each one, and we use. Toralock, which is a, has some antimicrobial properties. Now I've got a suture. This is a, a monocryl, which is a, a absorbable monofilament. Um, but you can use Vicro or other absorbable catheters to do a similar uh, suture. And this is, uh, I've got it on a straight needle, which is what I use for my subcuticular sutures. Uh, so um, I won't talk you through all the stages, but I'm basically just run run it down the subcuticular edge on each side and then knotted this is just me finishing off just knotting the skin here put tenting it up as I tension the the wound and then I've brought the needle out of the skin and what you end up with is a completely invisible uh, suture that the patient uh, won't be able to find in a few weeks time uh, the suture takes about four weeks to fully dissolve uh, for the second stitch, I use monocryl, sorry, I use ethylon, which is a, basically nylon, uh, again a monofilament. I wouldn't use silk because uh, for a number of reasons. First, silk is a foreign protein and so cause an inflammatory reaction. So fine for a temporary line for a few days, not good for um, uh, a longer period of time. Uh, um, I've taken a nice big bite. Uh, I first knot it to the skin and then I knot it uh, on each side using multiple knots, about eight or ten knots uh, on each side to fix it in place. Um, in those, I don't use this now, but we used to spray a bit of betadine, a bit of iodine on the exit site uh, and then cover it up. So these catheters work very well. They can stay in there for um, um, months, I say, even years. They do get complications. Um, they can uh, block with thrombus. They can also get covered by what's called a fibrin sheath. These are this is like a, a deposition, like a film of fibrin that can block the uh, holes at the end of the catheter and can stop it functioning. Um, and they have to be sorted out radiologically. And that is the end of this talk. I hope you found it helpful. Um, 